Good morning, my friends. I am still in Israel today and will be for a few days, so you'll see uh, some of these podcasts uh, from uh, on location here in Israel. Appreciate you joining us. It, I find it so just absolutely amazing that we are here in Romans chapter 10 while I'm in Jerusalem. And I, I'm sorry about yesterday's episode because I, I don't know how much teaching I did. I think it was more just being overwhelmed by the sense of irony to be in the Western Wall Plaza, to see the zeal of the Jewish people as they prayed for things like the restoration of the temple, for things like the coming of Messiah, things that have already been provided for them that they've just missed. And it just helped me in a very small sense to sense the heart of the Apostle Paul, who knew all those things and loved his own people and saw the validity of who Jesus was and was so careful to explain those scriptures everywhere he went and just had this heart of passion and compassion for his people and yet the violent rejection and the visceral reaction that they had to his ministry and how that must have crushed him time after time. It makes me understand some of the things he said about, I have continual sorrow in my heart. And although he suffered great physical pain at the hands of these opponents of the gospel, he had great passion. And the people that were so cruel to him, the people that were whipping him, he still loved them. You can love the ones that whip you. That's the love of Christ. Uh, I hear in that compassion of the Apostle Paul, the words of Jesus, when he said, love those uh, that hate you. Do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. I mean, that's not normal. That's not natural. That, that is the love of Christ in us. Because the natural reaction would be to say, I'm done. The natural reaction would be to hate back or to fight back. And yet the Apostle Paul never did that, never at all. That's not to say that there weren't people uh, that were among his brethren that he didn't have the chance to lead to Christ because he did. And th those were precious people. I think about Aquila and Priscilla, whom he personally discipled there in Corinth and how he spoke so fondly of them. Remember, uh, he said to the Romans in this very letter, we'll, we're going to get there in chapter 16, a uh, salute Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they, uh, they have laid down their necks for me. Uh, I love them. And so the Apostle Paul felt very deeply about the relationships that he forged and that God gave him. Uh, enough of all that. Look at Romans chapter 10. I want to go back to a section that we just kind of touched on yesterday. And that is the section that begins in verse number 5. And because Paul said, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. And here's how he describes it. That the man that doeth those things shall live by them. And I think we mentioned already that what that means is, if you will, are going to choose the, the law as a means of obtaining righteousness. And let me emphasize again that the law is not a means of obtaining righteousness. It is not. The law was added because of transgressions and it was there to further spotlight, to further indicate to the Jewish people that they were sinful, that they did need the covering that the blood provided, that they did need to keep their focus on the coming seed of Abraham. So the law was not a, an exchange for the Abrahamic covenant. No, it was a way to enhance the Abrahamic covenant, to show them that they needed to respond by faith to God, trusting in the provision. I, I said this earlier in, in a podcast, I don't know if I emphasized it well, but remember that at Sinai, God did not only give Moses the law. He did, he gave him the law, and the law, of course, is a reflection of God's righteousness, the perfect standard uh, that we have. It's certainly 
it, it's certainly a good thing. The law is good if a man use it lawfully. The Apostle Paul told Timothy that. But the law was not intended to save. So what did God also give a Moses at Sinai? He also gave him the way by which worship should take place. And so he gave him all of the details about the tabernacle and all the multifarious details about uh, the priest and how to conduct worship. And, and so, so the point is this, God said, here's the law, the law is not there to save you, but then here is the way by which you can have fellowship and relationship with me. And the fellowship and relational part was not a matter of law keeping. It was a matter of sacrifice. It was a matter of admitting that we fall short. It was a matter of recognizing that there had to be a mediatorship, that there had to be a covering. Now understand that when they slew those animals, and especially when the high priest slew that lamb on Passover, the Jews knew and were taught that that was not in any way a cleansing of sin, but rather a covering. Why? Why was it not a cleansing? Because cleansing would mean the stain is removed. A covering means the stain is now dealt with in the fact that we're not looking at it, it's overlooked in that sense, but the covering was only a temporary stopgap until the true lamb would come and cleansing could take place. That's why the language of the book of Hebrews where Jesus is better. He's better than the Old Testament system. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. He's better than the Aaronic priesthood. He's better than uh, the angels. Why? Because he offered once for all his blood. No need for sacrificial system now. No need for uh, the blood of a, an animal. Why? Because Jesus once for all offered himself. He suffered without the gate. He became our sin for us. That's the point. So here in Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is carefully explaining yet again uh, to these people that Moses, the one that you're trusting in, because Moses, the name Moses often is used as a metonymy for the law and that system. And Moses, no, the law itself tells us that the law itself is not sufficient for salvation. So listen to what Moses said. I think about what Jesus testified in John chapter five. Remember when he stood before the Jewish leadership and he said to them, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. So when Jesus defended himself there after the pool of Bethesda healing, he said to them, you think you know the scriptures, but if you really knew the scriptures, you would know that they testify of a redeemer, of a coming Messiah, of a coming suffering servant. And uh, he, in, in, in essence, rebuked them for their lack of knowledge. And then in that same passage, he goes on to say, you know, you are claiming that, you know, well, you have Moses, you know, like it's Moses versus Jesus. And what Jesus said is, it's not Moses versus Jesus. No, Moses spoke of me. So you're trusting Moses, but Moses spoke of me. That's why when he was walking with the Emmaus disciples there on the morning of the resurrection, as they walked toward Emmaus, the Bible says, and beginning at Moses. So that would be the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. That would be the rest of the Bible. Uh, to their Bible was the Old Testament. So Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So it's not, it should not be odd to us as we look at Romans chapter 10 to see that the apostle Paul is saying, everything I'm telling you, I'm not introducing you to you a new religion. I'm not saying to you, okay, exchange Judaism for Jesus. What he's saying is Judaism is Jesus. Judaism culminates in Jesus. So here in Israel, it's sad because when you speak to Jewish people that don't know Jesus as their Messiah, 
they view Christianity as antagonistic toward Judaism. They view Christianity as the repudiation of Judaism. And yet, what do we know? We know that the earliest Christians were Jews. And the most Jewish thing that a Jewish person can do is to receive a Jewish Messiah, to understand that the redemptive narrative in the Bible culminating in a, the seed of Abraham and the son of David dying upon the cross was for them first. That's why it says in John 1, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. He didn't come only to his own, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the authority, the spiritual right to be called the sons, the children of God. And that's the whole point that the Apostle Paul is making about the Gentiles here in the end of chapter 9 and of course in chapter 11 is the fact that there, God has every right to include everybody. Why? Because we can all be children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. You've heard it this way. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Quick time check here. Uh, let's look at verse number uh, six. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Now, I mentioned yesterday, and I'm not going to take time to read all these verses because I'm running out of time. But in Deuteronomy chapter 30, remember as the Moses has reminded the second generation about to enter into the promised land. Don't be like your dads. Let me preach you a sermon. Let me recap the law. Let me recap the heart of God. And then he, he talked about the, the, the need for them to, to rely upon God's mercy. He said, listen, you are going to fail in the land of promise. You are going to renege. God is going to have to bring chastisement. But what God is looking for is your heart. He's looking for a heart to serve him, a heart to love him, a heart to choose him. That's the passage. If you want to read it carefully, I would encourage you to do that. Begin in like verse number six of Deuteronomy 30. Take it all the way through like verses 15 and 16. It's an amazing passage. But what's interesting is in the Old Testament, the passage talks about, hey, you can make this decision. This is not some kind of a decree that God has made to you against your will. No, God says, listen, I've given you right information. Now the decision is in your court. You can choose life or death. You can choose me. You can choose to follow me or reject me. It's your choice. I'm giving you the right information. I'm telling you it's about me. It's not about your works. It's about your cho choice to follow me. All of that's there if you look at Re Deuteronomy 30. And then the point that Moses makes is you don't have to earn this, this right to make this decision. It's, you don't have to go to heaven to, to make this decision. You don't have to cross the ocean. No, it's right here in front of you. There's nothing more you have to do than to just decide on the word of God that's been presented to you. You can make this choice. This is not hard. It's available to you if you'll simply but make it. What Paul does in Romans chapter 10 is he gives us more information. So it's scripture explaining scripture. It's scripture expanding upon scripture. So in Deuteronomy 30, the, the whole point about going to, you know, uh, not having to go to heaven to make this decision or cross the ocean to make this decision, it's right here in front of you. The apostle Paul now supplies the reason. He says, say not in thine heart. See that here in verse number six, who shall ascend into heaven? Then he says parenthetically, that is to bring down Christ from above. So you don't have to earn salvation by somehow climbing to heaven. No, Christ already came. He did for us what we couldn't do. We couldn't get to heaven through our righteousness. So what did Jesus do? He emptied himself. He came to us because we couldn't go to him. And then it says, or who shall descend into the deep? Again, quote, quoting Deuteronomy 30, Parenthetically, that is to bring up Christ again for the dead. So there's nothing you have to do to be saved. You can't get to heaven by your works. And you can't, if you try to pay for your salvation by dying, going down into the deep. No, Christ died for us. 
He, he came for us. He, he descended from heaven for us. He descended into our hell for us. He paid the penalty of sin for us. Uh, he was the one that set captivity free by going to paradise that day of his crucifixion. It's Jesus that did the work. That's what the Bible is teaching us here. So there's nothing left for us to do. Salvation is not doing. No, what we do is we respond by faith. Faith is not works. Faith is the opposite of works. Faith is trusting the works of another. And so trust what Jesus did. He did what we could not do. And so the word is nigh unto us. That is even the word of faith. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the gospel. Jesus came. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus did what we could not do. Paul's heart for the Jews is just so raw here. So believe. It's already done. The word is right there. Accept him by faith. We're out of time. Unfortunately, we're over time. I'm sorry. So I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing, or uh, next episode, I guess I should say. Until then, have a great day in the Lord. God bless you.